Hello, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural World War II Emerging Scholars Symposium. We are pleased to have the Eisenhower, Roosevelt, and Truman Libraries work together in creating this platform for new scholars. Today, we are thrilled to, to introduce Hannah Paulsa. She is going to speak with us a little bit about dogs for defense. All right, and then thank you so much, Joy, for the introduction. I wanted to first thank the Eisenhower, Truman, and Roosevelt Libraries for putting on this symposium. It's a really neat thing as a PhD student to be included in something like this when your research is just getting off the ground. But it's really neat to be able to talk about my research and something that is so important and so loved by me in terms of looking at dogs for defense and the children who participated in it. And before I start, I actually want to examine a little bit the first image on my PowerPoint, which is a advertisement from the 1943 edition of the American Kennel Club Gazette. And it says, so long pal, be a good soldier. And in the um, advertisement, which was sponsored by Purina Dog Chow, we actually see a young boy donating his dog and it says within the text, there's going to be a gold star on the dog house at 317 Elm Street this summer. And so the little boy is donating his dog to war. And it mentions how Jack is not to be crying and there are no tears to be shed. Although Jack is having a very hard time because his dog Pal is being donated to Dogs for Defense and is going to participate in World War II. And for thousands of children across America, they did donate their dogs to military service during the war. And so images like these, whether they be in print and be fictional or be printed in real life newspaper ads, were commonplace throughout the US as children said goodbye to their dogs. And one thing that I wanna er um, iterate today with my presentation is how children really understood and responded to Dogs for Defense as an organization and how they understood that participating in Dogs for Defense allowed them to be a bigger part in the war effort and the United States involvement in World War II. And next slide. So before we begin looking at how children and Dogs for Defense interacted, one thing that we need to understand is exactly how children were viewed before World War II and during the war. So prior to the 19th century, children were often considered to be many adults. The focus on raising children was more on their economic impact and how they could contribute to a family setting rather than their thoughts and feelings or playtime. We often think of the phrase children were seen, were to be seen and not heard. And this is one phrase that really um, makes me think of childhood before the 19th century because children were encouraged just to help with the farm or really were ignored until they became of age where they could start earning wages. And so prior, um, when the 19th century came around, we see the concept of childhood as we know it. Play was encouraged between children. We see children's literature develop in order to teach morals and how to be good citizens to kids. And we see schooling focusing not only on morals and how to be good citizens, but games and things. So the concept of childhood really begins in the 19th century. Now, when you get into the Great Depression, we see the drop of bro the drop the birth rate drop because of the economic st instability. However, during the war, we actually see a baby boom, and that is actually because there is a marriage boom during World War II as well. The marriage rate at 1939 was at 73%. However, during the war, we see the marriage rate, rate increase steadily. In 1941, it jumps to 88.5%. In 1942, it jumps to 93%. The year after, the birth rates were at the highest that they had been during it, they had been. In 1943, there are 3,104,000 births of children during the war. Now, these children that I'll be discussing were the ones born during the Depression. And because of this, they were much more in tune to anxieties and fears over family members leaving 
anxieties over the war, in part, in part, were in tune to their duties as children during a war. They understood that they had to collect scrap metal, per purchase war bonds, and maybe help in a victory garden, and really to do anything that they could to play a part to win the war. And during the war, 18.1% of families, or one in every five, had a loved one serving in the armed forces or assisting in the war efforts. And next slide, please. The more complicated topic is the status of pets. Prior to the 19th century, animals were often viewed as dumb and were viewed instead in terms of their economic necessities, whether it be helping out in pulling railroad cars, becoming meat, shearing for wool, or being guard dogs. Animals were not viewed really as much with the kind of sympathetic and emotional attachments that we think of today. The 19th century saw this idea of pets as we know it invented. Pets have been defined as animals who have a special, some sort of special significance, whether it be a special name, they come into the home, or they're just the favorite out of a herd of cattle that you bond to. The reason that pets become so proliferant in 19th century America is that they become linked to the raising of children. Pets, become in, pets come into the home because there was the belief that keeping animals for companionship and, sent, and their status as sentinel beings were more important to raising children to be humane rather than the animal status as meat production, wool production, guard thing, guard dogs or anything like that. It was a belief that pets, pets and children linked together not only because of their helplessness and both in their inability to talk, but because they could become good things to raise children with and that they could benefit from one another. Children learned how to be good adults through the raising of pets and pets were transformed into something that the entire family could love. So humane organizations and animal welfare is often did, often created ideas such as Be Kind to Animals Week. And so Be Kind to Animals Week were things that were created for school children to understand how to interact humanely with animals and treat them with kindness. They were often run by the local humane societies and the American Humane Education League. So during the 1930s, we see the status of pets is a bit different because in one hand, we see the rise of small animal veterinary care because of the lack of large animal clients and we see the dog food industry increasing profits. However, we also see during the depression, more profits are made on animal bodies. And by that, I mean, we see much more dog breeders getting into puppy mill trades. And we see increases in animal fighting, whether they be cock fighting or dog fighting. Money was to be made on animal bodies as much as people were saving money to scrimp by to get their animals vaccinated during the Great Depression. So one thing that we do need to understand about pet keeping, which begins the 19th century and continues into the 20th, is that pet keeping is often tied to upper and middle class white families. And it's because that for pet keeping, especially in the 19th century, it was a status symbol for the upper and wealthy classes and that you had money to spend on these animals that did not offer anything but companionship. And so next slide, please. So what was Dogs for Defense? So the United States actually attempted to have a dog army in World War I. A bill was passed in Congress by United States Senator James H. Brady for the appropriation, raising, and training of war dogs to be trained as Red Cross dogs. Red Cross dogs would have been trained for locating wounded soldiers and fetching assistance or comfort those dying. These dogs had shown promise in World War I, used by every army, but mainly gained popularity in France and England. However, the bill failed to pass because it was believed that the public sentiment could not be gained for something like this and that there were just not enough dogs to train in the amount of time. So the bill was shelved in 1918. It would not be until World War II that dogs would actually see military service. Dogs for Defense was founded by an AKC poodle breeder named Aileen Erlanger. In an interview with Roland Kilburn for his column, Popular Dogs, she stated simply, the dog must play a part in this game. 
For Erlanger, the idea was simple. Convince the American public to donate their pets to military service. The organization Dogs for Defense was formed in January of 1942, and it was comprised of well-to-dos of the dog fancy world, including breeders and showmen like Erlanger, kennel hands, field trial judges, and really anyone involved in the dog world or that loved dogs. On March 13, 1942, 200 sentry dogs were donated in to be trained by Dogs for Defense. This would be the first time the dogs were recognized for military service. Initially, dogs were taken, any dog was taken, as long as it met the size requirement of 20 inches at the shoulder and the weight requirement beginning at 50 pounds and no more than 85. However, the list was soon dropped down to four preferred breeds in 1944, the, Chow the German Shepherds, Dobermans, Giant Schnauzers, and Farm Collies. Dogs were trained in a variety of tasks, including how to be sentries, scout dogs, messengers, red cross, and sludge and pack dogs. However, most ads caused, called for dogs to be trained as sentries with the tagline, one dog is worth two men. In total, 18,000 dogs were recruited and donated by Dogs for Defense for military service, and about half of them served in the military. military. Most dogs were rejected for being storm shy or not aggressive enough. War dog training and reception centers existed in California, Nebraska, Montana, Virginia, and one little famous Cat Island, Mississippi. Dogs served in every theater of the war and also served stateside in the Coast Guard. And next slide, please. One of the ways that children interacted with dogs for defense was writing letters directly in enlisting their animal. On the right side of the screen, we see Raymond Height from Long Beach, California, writing a letter to see how his dog Shere Khan is doing in the army. Shere Khan was donated by Raymond, and as we can see, even the, the local kitty cat is participating in checking in on the beloved dog. Raymond mentions that he misses Shere Khan terribly and that he even hung up a gold star in the window to show that their family too had a soldier. However, as we see on the letter on the letter from John Paul Miller, who lived in Buffalo, New York, Miller actually writes Henry I. Caesar directly, who is the president of Dogs for Defense, to donate his dog. And his letter reads, Dear Mr. Caesar, please take muggins for army work. My brother is 18 years old and is joining the Flying Cadets. I am eight years old and too young to do that but you may have my dog. I love him very much. But mother says we all must help to win the war. He is so strong. I know the soldiers will love him. Please answer soon. I will have muggins ready. John Paul Miller. And on the bottom, we have another letter written by young Bobby Britton of Morgan Hill, California. Unlike Miller, Britton wrote his local recruiting office for dogs for defense. His letter reads, I am eight years old and live on a farm. I have a large Australian shepherd that is a very good hunter, and I think he would be good hunting Japs. He sure likes to kill skunks. If you need a real good dog, I will loan you mine until the war is over. Letter writing for children was a way not only to stay connected with parents who served in the front line, but also in this case to directly answer the call for dogs and donate their animals to service. So for many of the children, the prevailing theme throughout their letters was, I cannot fight, but my dog can. So children understood they had to do their part in the war effort, but also knew that they were too young to enlist in the armed forces. For these children who wrote letters to donate their dogs, for children who wrote letters donating their dogs, having the dog serve in their place was the next best thing. However, for children, the Writers' War Board cautioned that no images of crying children donated their, donating their dogs be repurposed in any propaganda material or the newspapers. It was the belief that children crying as they said goodbye to the beloved pets would lead to an increase in dog donations because no parent wanted to see their child upset after giving the family dog away. However, this still did not this did not persuade children from writing letters and donating their animals. 
Next slide, please. The War Dog Fund was another avenue that children were able to directly participate in. The War Dog Fund was established in 1943 by James A. Austin. The concept was simple. It was a canine home guard. It was for dogs who could not serve, whether they be classified as 4F, which meant an ineligible for service, and these were often puppies, older dogs, tiny breeds, or dogs that did not meet the height and weight requirement. In the picture, we see Marilyn Clark, who's donating money for her Lewin Setter puppy, Blue Smoke Alice, to become a third-class petty officer in the waves. Now, the amount, the amount that a child could donate with their allowance money depended. They could donate $1 to secure their dog the lowest rank in either the Navy or the Army, and donations could go upward to $100. And so... For children, as we see in this letter, they often decided to participate in the War Dog Fund, either because their animals were too young to donate, to their animals were too young to enlist, or their animals were needed for other places. So this unnamed boy wrote, I am a boy nine years old. My dad fought in World War I. He's too old to go to this war, and I am too young. We have a very good helper, Top, my dog. Daddy says we cannot do without him. Enclosed, please find one dollar for which I wish to use to register my dog as a soldier war dog. So for chil for children like the unnamed boy, it was the war dog fund was an often was a way to participate without having to share the painful goodbye and anxiety over a dog's depart into military service. However, it was not just dogs that were enlisted in the war dog fund. Canaries, turtles, and even cats all purchased rank in the War Dog Fund to help secure dogs that were, were eligible for, dog, for the front lines. In fact, some cat owners even believed that there should be a War Cat Fund established so that cats could earn the appropriate military rank as their dog friends and enlist in the war effort as well. And the War Dog Fund actually ended up being one of the most profitable fundraising avenues that Dogs for Defense was able to go. In total, the fundraising, including the War Dog Fund, but other fundraisers participated with Dogs for Defense, raised over $2 million to be able to secure inappropriate dogs for the front line and other, and other duties needed to raise animals for the war effort. And so for the War Dog Fund, it was another way for children to spend allowance money rather than just buying a war bond or saving it up for a certain toy. It was a way for children to feel like they were participating in the war effort. And next slide, please. So children's literature. So two of the ways that children were able to participate in Dogs for Defense without either donating an animal or donating money was through the consumption of children's literature. A 1943 review in the New York Times stated, books about animals, war dogs, or a new note here are among the children's favorites now as they ever were. And in his book, Daddy's Gone to War, historian William Tuttle states, publishers released very few war-inspired stories for children. And librarians' list of recommended children's books were relatively devoid of war-inspired stories. For children's literature in World War II, it was often focused on the home front and how children could help the war effort. Blood and gore and traditional battle and fight scenes were often discouraged as to not heighten the anxieties of children that were already experiencing so much. So the four books that I've laid out, Jeeps, A Dogs for Defense by Sylvester C. Watkins, Valiant Comrades by Ruth Adams Knight, Tommy and His Dog Hurry by Helen Josephine Ferris, and Private Pepper of Dogs for Defense by Francis Cavanaugh Weir are just some of the books written for children during World War II. I think in my collection alone, I think I have 10 books written on war dogs for children during the war. Now, every, every book listed deals with young boys wanting struggling with the idea to donate their animals to the war effort. 
In Jeeps, we see his young owner, Don, initially not wanting to donate his dog to the war effort. He believes that other dogs could be taken instead of his Jeeps. However, it takes gentle prodding from a nice mailman to convince Don that dogs really were indeed needed for the war effort. And so in the end, Don does donate Jeeps. And in the end of the book, Don is rewarded when Jeeps is awarded a medal for capturing a German, a Japanese soldier outside of the camp that Jeeps is stationed in. In Tommy and His Dog Hurry by Helen Josephine Ferris, Tommy also does not want to donate Hurry. He believes that the art, he believes that the military can find other dogs, and he's worked very hard on training Hurry to salute the flag. However, after again gentle prodding from her, his mother, Tommy decides to donate his dog, Hurry. As a reward, he is rewarded with a collie pup from the Army Air Force Colonel for the, ba the fictional base that his father is stationed at. In Pepper, we see Keith actually eagerly donating Pepper to the service. He hears about Dogs for Defense on a radio bulletin, and after interpreting Pepper's excited barks as, yes, Pepper wants to join the service, Keith decides to donate his dog. Unlike Tommy, unlike Tommy and Don, Pepper has no qual Keith has no qualms about donating his animal to the military. Although upset, he understands that it is his patriotic duty to donate his dog. Pepper is unique in that most of the war dog children's stories were focused on dogs who served in the Pacific Theater. Pepper serves in D-Day. Pepper is the only dog to serve in D-Day and receives an honorable discharge after being wounded. However, unlike Jeeps and Hurry, Keith does not receive a citation for Pepper's bravery. Instead, she receives a new dog house after Pepper returns home from the war. Many of these fictional dog stories dealt with the internal monologues of children trying to donate, trying to decide whether to donate or not to donate their dogs to the war effort. However, these dog stories often had the bigger goal of explaining the organization of Dogs for Defense and why dogs were exactly needed for the war effort to children. Whether they be explained by mothers such as Tommy's mother and Tommy and his dog, Hurry, or by radio advertisements such as in Private Pepper of Dogs for Defense, the goal of children's literature was to explain why dogs were needed for the war effort and how children could participate in donating their dogs. Now, there was occasionally children's literature that focused on the idea that donated dogs could help bring soldiers home and end the war quicker. In Famous Mascots and Canines by Mabel Harmer, we see that in a chapter entitled Sailor, two young, bo two young children hear of dog donations through radio advertisement. Both children do not want to donate their dog, but the older girl, Anne, decides that to donate Sailor would mean bringing home her uncles sooner from the war and ending the war. So for children, the idea that fictional children donated their animals without much stress or ups, up, without much stress or heartache would have been possibly a sign to donate their own animals. Or, if anything else, it would have been a story that taught them the importance of why dogs were needed for the military and how Dogs for Defense operated as an organization. Next slide, please. The other avenue that children would have had to understand Dogs for Defense and be encouraged to donate their own animals were the war dog films and cartoons that were published. Historian Aaron Skablin states, many military dog films encourage people to donate dogs to the military, frequently celebrating the supposed exploits of army dogs and frequently connecting moviegoers to the military in the war. However, World War II was not the beginning of the military dog genre as we think of. As historian Susan Joan points out, canine films blended the ordinary with fantasy, making their movies immaculate inaccessible to anyone who had a who had a relationship with a dog. The family dog was cut from the same cloth as Rin Tin Tin. The war dog film gained popularity following the end of World War I. 
In these films, brave heroic dogs brought comfort to their soldiers that they served within the trenches and often were the guiding light in the morality of soldiers who were stuck on the Western Front. For the war dog film, families who saw these often pictured their own dogs in heroics, whether it be looking at the escapades of Rin Tin Tin or following the dogs along in some of the films that were produced during the war era. The first film to produ be produced about war dogs is aptly titled War Dogs, released in 1942. It was released in November, so only a few months after Dogs for Defense had formed as an organization and dogs had been recruited for military service. In the film, the fictional boy Billy donates his dog Pal, who serves with Billy's downtrodden World War II one veteran father. His father and Pal end up being assigned to guarding a factory, and during it, Bill's Billy's father heroically takes a bomb away from a German saboteur and ends up dying in the explosion. However, Powell ends up capturing the saboteur and is awarded as a hero. In the end, although Billy's father perishes, Billy and Powell are adopted by the juvenile court system to give a happy ending for everyone. In Sergeant Mike, released in 1944, SK a young child named SK donates his dog, Mike. And donating the dog, he gives this reason. I wanted to fight. Mike and I went down to the local recruiting office, but they would not take kids. He joined up, and we both felt better. SK compel feels compelled to donate Mike after the death of his brother in the Pacific Theater. However, like so many of the children already explained, he understands that his age makes him ineligible for military service. So instead, he decides to donate his dog, Mike. The interesting thing about Sergeant Mike compared to war dogs is that Sergeant Mike used a real-life war dog as the canine actor. In Spitting Thing, the actor played, the actor who played Mike was actually a real-life dog named Mike who was donated by his young owner, Hal Hoverson, from, from Minnesota. So Mike actually is a real-life dog which helped add some of the authentic authenticity to the film compared to a canine actor used in War Dogs. For the Walt Disney films, we see two produced in the World War II era dealing with the subject of War Dogs. In 1943, the cartoon Private Pluto was produced. In this, it's not only it's the first appearance of the Chippendale chipmunks, and we see them harassing Pluto as he is a guard dog for a base. And in 1945, we see the Canine Patrol. And the reason that I link the Canine Patrol is because I love the beginning of it. And the title, I guess you would call the title slide before the movie actually begins. In it, it says, Canine Patrol dedicated to the dogs of the U.S. Coast Guards. For the Walt Disney Studios, they were actually very close to the War Dog Training and Reception Center in San Carlos, California. And so it, there possibly would have been Disney been able to, and the artist would have been able to review, view dogs being trained for the war effort, or at least may have seen them patrolling the beaches up and down the studios. The Disney Studios actually did the letterhead for the San Carlos War Dog Training and Reception Centers, which I think is actually really neat. And in 1943, we see Hanna-Barbera Studios releasing the cartoon titled War Dogs. It features Private Smiley, who is the kind of little loser for the um, War Dog Training and Reception Centers, the fake wolf's campaign that he is assigned to. And so unlike the Canine Patrol or Private Pluto or any of the major Hollywood motion pictures. Four Dogs is a fake mockumentary to show the rather hijinks of how dogs were trained for war and following Private Smiley's, he attempts to become a good dog in Uncle Sam's army. And so for children who saw these films, they would have seen not only fictional children donating their dogs, but they also would have seen in the beginning acknowledgements to owners who had already donated their animals. 
both War Dogs and Sergeant Mike had acknowledgments in the beginning of how dogs should be donated and why it's so important to donate their dogs. They also would have seen the acknowledgments to the handlers as well and for those serving. For children who would have attended the showing of War Dogs, they may have even seen puppies set in boxes in theaters. The promoters of War Dogs believed that setting up puppies with a big sign that said, we are going to be War Dogs when we grow up, would have allowed patrons to either donate to the War Dog Fund or even consider donating their own animals to the fund, to military service, or the belief that these little puppies too can one day grow up to be canine soldiers. So in conclusion, Dogs for Defense recruited about 18,000 dogs for military service, and around 10,000 of those served. So Dogs for Defense relied on civilian donations, whether it be from single men and women, families, boys and girls, or even celebrities offering their own dogs, or even kennel masters offering breeding stocks for the war effort. Dogs served in every part of the war, but, main, but many saw action in the Pacific Theater and the European Theater. Following the war's end, a dog who had been in service was distrained and detrained, and went through a process to be able to become the happy, friendly pet again. So children who anxiously sent their dogs away in 1942 were excited to learn that their dog would be coming home and that nothing would have changed except maybe the dog would have been better trained than when they had left. And so for Dogs for Defense, this would not have been pop possible without adults and children donating their own animals. For children, it was the belief that you you put your emotional attachments to your dog aside, and that the idea that your country in its hour of need is greater than any love that you may feel for your animal. If children did not wish to donate their animal directly, the War Dog Fund was another avenue for them to explore. Children donated allowance money, whether it be $1 or even saving up for the with help from parents to donate a hundred dollars to pur to purchase their dog a rank in the war dog fund whether it be in the army or navy or the female acting correspondence so for children they had two avenues to directly participate in dogs for defense either write or donate their dog directly to dogs for defense whether it be writing a letter or going directly down to the recruiting office to donate their animal in person, or to participate in the War Dog Fund in donating money, whether it be an individual donation or, in some cases, a classroom setting to donate funds for, for, for dogs to go to war. For children, who, for children, other avenues were often offered to explore dogs for defense and how dogs were needed for service. Children's literature taught kids the importance of why dogs were needed and how they could directly help the war effort by their donation. Fictional children struggle with the idea of donating their dogs just as real life children would have. However, these children would have seen the bravery and sacrifice that fictional children made in donating their dogs, and it may have pushed them to donate their own animals, or nonetheless, it was at least a story that they could read with their parents at night or by themselves to further understand how dogs were needed for military service. The films and cartoons produced in the era would have again shown children donating their animals to the war effort and would have taught children how dogs were trained in the case of both Sergeant Mike and war dogs, or it would have offered them more hilarious escapades of a war dog in service, such as the cartoons produced by the Walt Disney Company or Hanna-Barbera's cartoon War Dogs. Either way, films and cartoons allowed children to experience the war effort and, how, and the dog in war through the safety of the movie screens, but maybe would have given them thought to think of if their own animal would have been suitable for military service. However, when we think of the military working dog today, so much emphasis, and rightly so, is placed on individual dogs and the handlers. This is not to be understated. However, 
When we think of the military working dog, we also must consider the people who donated their dogs to the service. Although, individ although owner donations stopped with World War II and afterwards in Korea, we would see the beginnings of breeding programs that we are familiar with today. We cannot underscore the, some, the value that owner donations had and owner participation had during war in getting a program like Dogs for Defense off the ground. Because for World War II especially, if we only choose to focus on what dogs did during their service and how they interacted with their handlers and ignore the civilian um, contribution, we really ignore the legacy of the World War II dog. The military working dogs as we know today would not be here without civilians willing to donate their own animals to the military service and understanding that yes, my dog may not come back from war, but I'm doing what I believe is the greater good for my country. There is a quote by Franklin, the humorous Franklin P. Adams in Thomas Young's Dogs for Democracy book released in 1944 that I think is relevant. And if you have any idea that somebody who gives a dog for war isn't sacrificing anything, you have never had a dog that was a member of your family. You have never had a little girl or boy whose affection was given to a dog. For children who donated their dogs, it was just another way for them to participate in the war effort. Instead of donating scrap metal or participating in victory gardens, sewing socks, or buying war bonds, children could donate their animals. It was a donation of something sacrificed. And for children, it was a donation of something sacrificed and often one of their best friends. But for these children who decided to donate their dogs, in a moment, they decided that their love of country and their belief that we need to win the war effort was more important than their emotional attachments to their dogs. And I think that's one thing that we need to remember when we think about the legacy of the dog in World War II, is that it would not have been possible to have the military working dog programs that we have today without the owner sacrifice and without the idea of dogs for defense who decided to take a chance on America's dog owners and believed that yes, even though it may be painful, people are willing to donate their dogs to military service. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was very interesting. Uh, we do have a, at this time, we're going to take questions. So if you have questions, go ahead and uh, type them in the chat or in the comments uh, so that we can see them. There are a few questions that we already have, so I'll go ahead and get started with those. So the first question, it's a two-part question. How many war dogs were there and how many died in World War II? So we have um, records that about 18,000 in total were donated. The number fluctuates between 18 to 20,000 dogs in service, but around roughly half of those were donated. So if we think about nine to 10,000 animals were donated, saw service, I should say. So if we think of an entire division as about 10,000 men, about 10,000 dogs were able to form a division, which I think is kind of cool. In terms of the amount killed during the war, that would be one thing that I would have to research on a little bit more because we have some casualty listings, but I think it might stand the last time I looked at it about maybe 2,000 in total killed. Most of the dogs were able to come home. In fact, detraining and demobilization began as early as 1944 when it was the belief that dogs weren't to be utilized anymore in the European theater because it was believed that they wouldn't be as useful when fighting began to congregate in urban cities and in more winter warfare compared to the Marine war dogs of the Pacific theater. Okay. Wow. That's good to hear. Or good to know that so many made it back home. Um, can can you tell me a little bit more about what made certain breeds better than other breeds for war? Yeah, so in the beginning, um, there were a standard a list of breeds that were preferred. 
And so in the beginning, Dogs for Defense organizers believed that any breed would be good. However, they began, and this included the mongrels or the mutts. However, they did believe that the purebreds were better because of the genetic makeup of the dogs. They soon realized that there were certain breeds that were more valuable for the war effort, whether it be German Shepherds, Dobermans, Farm Collies, Giant Schnauzers, or if you were in the snowy banks of Montana with Camp Rimini, St. Bernard's, Huskies, Malamutes, or Newfoundlands for sledge work. And it was the belief that genetics in the purebred dog really made them more suitable for the war effort. And in addition to that, they also believed that male dogs preferred over females, not only because of the number of intact females that were sent to the war dog training and reception centers that ended up bearing puppies. It was also <laughs> the belief that just female dogs were more storm shy and less aggressive than their male counterparts. And so for the idea of the pure, the standard dog, which would have been the German Shepherd, which was adopted as the official military dog in 1946, it was the belief that their coats weren't as fluffy to be able to pick up birds and things in areas and that their keen sense of smell and hearing and that their disposition were the kind of the perfect qualities that were needed for a war dog as compared to a giant schnauzer or a Dalmatian which as a fun fact, they did enlist Dalmatians only for a brief period. They also realized that dyeing the Dalmatian spots did not work because eventually the dye rubbed off. And so Dalmatians weren't really good in the more terrain, the Pacific theater, because they were easy to spot. And so a lot of the Dalmatians, if they saw service, it would have been maybe on the Coast Guard or in the European theater where they may have been able to blend in a bit better. So you did just kind of hit on a lot of this, but um, when looking at the dog breed or a dog period in their service, you know, what exactly were they trying to accomplish with with this dog service? Like that, that then lended itself to what breed they thought would best accomplish these things. You know, so what they wanted with the dog service was they wanted a dog that would be good to do mainly sentry and scout work, but also could do messenger work if needed. And so they were looking for a dog that would have weighed between 55 to 85 pounds and would have started at about 20 inches at the shoulder. And so the idea was to train dogs for sentry work, meaning that you could take a dog at the end of the leash with your sentry and your patrol, and that dog would be able to hear anything because of their superior hearing and smell. It would have been able to pick up the enemy almost immediately as soon as they were sighted. And so certain dogs would have been better at this in terms of just possessing the better genetic quality compared to some of the counterparts. So then we're talking about a very rigorous training then, right? Mm -hmm. So training would have been about, it would have been eight weeks in terms of just the soldiers going through classes or to learn how to handle dogs, because many of the soldiers that came in to the war dog training and reception centers had maybe some idea of how to handle dogs. They may have been, had farm dogs growing up, or they may have had hunting dogs. So some of the soldiers would have come in with some sort of dog experience or they would have been completely green. And it was a crash course for everyone because when Dogs for Defense formed, the military had no standard in how to train military dogs. And that's why you see the first few platoons of dogs that, are, that go into battle in 1942. It's very hectic. It's the dogs are frightened. They don't really understand what to do. It's not the belief that the army wanted when training these dogs. And so in 1943, you actually see a technical manual published on how to train and effectively care for war dogs and the standards that were to be accepted. And so with that real um, 
emphasized and militarized training that begins in 1943, you begin to see the kind of dog that we think of today when it comes to the military working dog. Extremely disciplined, highly active in terms of knowing what their job needs to be done. And I think one thing that people tend to forget when we think of military working dogs is that, especially for German Shepherds, is that this is what these dogs were bred for. They were bred for police work. They are bred to be guard dogs. These dogs are enjoying what they're doing. And that's even to be said for the World War II dogs. Training was as much as making the dog understand what it needed to do as it was to make the dog enjoy what it was wanted to do. Okay, we have another question. Um, at what location, camp or fort, were the dogs trained? Yeah, so there were forts in San Carlos, California. There was Front Royal, Virginia, Fort Robinson, Nebraska. You have Cat Island, Mississippi. <laughs> And you have Camp Rimini in Helena, Montana, which was the sole purpose for training sledge and pack dogs. So dogs that would have been needed in more winter areas. Interesting. Have you seen the war dog, any of the war dog movies? Yeah, the war dogs film is actually up to f available on YouTube to watch. So it's, it's fun. It's that campy kind of World War II film. But Sergeant Mike, I actually own the DVD of, and it's actually really neat. It goes into a lot of detail on how dogs were trained, which is nice. Because if children weren't able to see some of the uh, military footage released into theaters on how dogs were trained and used, watching Sergeant Mike really gave them idea of how dogs went through the training process. They actually hired a few military dog trainers to make sure that everything was authentic. And in terms of the cartoons, Private Pluto and Canine Patrol, I think are both available on YouTube are part of the Disney propaganda films set that's been released. So those have been fun to watch. So uh, let's talk about a little bit more about the, the uh, training. You said that they kind of, those movies, some of them depict the trainings uh, pretty accurately. So, um, can you talk a little bit more about exactly what the trainings look like, what they, you know, what paces um, that they put the dogs through? Yeah, so um, for training, so after a dog arrived at a war dog training and reception center, it underwent a physical from a veterinary. It got all of its inoculations. If it didn't have them already, it received tattoos either inside of the ear or on the inside of the left flank. And then the dog was assigned to a handler. And this was after the handler had already gone through a few weeks of training because they didn't want a green handler assigned to a dog that they knew nothing about. And so there were often two handlers per one dog and handlers were instructed that only they were allowed to give the dog pets. And that this was to enforce, um, enforce the idea of a one handler, one dog situation. And so for all dogs, even if they came in with basic obedience, they went through basic obedience again. So dogs learned how to sit, they learned how to come on command, they learned how to stay, lie down, to really get the fundamentals of obedience again that would be needed in the field. After that was done, it then depended on how the dog would to be used in the field. Sentry dogs were trained different than messenger dogs. Messenger dogs worked with two men, with one going off a farther distance and a, and a message was placed under the dog's collar. The dog was taught to go to the man and allow the collar to be opened to reveal the message. And then either a reply was written to go back or the training would be ended. For scout dogs and sentry dogs, they would have done mock patrols with the soldiers. All dogs also learned how to do bite work. However, dogs were not trained to specifically be attack dogs. The army did not once pure attack dogs. Instead, they wanted animals that would have at least been able to attack if the command was given, but they did not want pure vicious dogs. It still would have been a dog that would have been able to go back to being relaxed after a command to attack was given. Wow. Um, Melody Sexton would like to know, have you seen the War Dog Memorial at Fort Benning, Georgia? 
I have not yet. I know that there, um, if it's the one that I'm thinking about, it's the rep the replication of the always faithful monument that lies on the Guam battlefield. And so during the second battle of Guam in 1944, 25 dogs were killed in action. And the leader actually establishes the war dog cemetery. And in the 1990s, there's actually a sculpture depicting the first, the Doberman killed, the Doberman named Kurt, which is the first war dog to be killed in the second battle of Guam, rest atop a bronze, mar a statue of all, more of a coffin that has that bears the name of the 25 dogs killed in action. And so there were replicas of that statue, I know at least at the University of Tennessee Veterinary Hospital. And so it's one thing that if I'm not able to see the actual one in Guam, I think seeing the replica would be pretty cool as well. Uh, Tony Sarcone would like to know uh, at what university are you a doctoral candidate? I am a third year PhD student at Kansas State University. So I will be, be having my prelims this fall. So that'll be fun. Good luck with that. Um, so if we don't have any other questions, I'll give you guys a, a, a second or two to a few seconds rather to uh, type in any more questions in the comments. But otherwise, uh, we are going to uh, do a little bit of a transition after. So following this presentation, we are going to uh, take a little time to learn a little bit more about Hannah um, and what we're calling our Scholar Spotlight. Uh, same place, so we're going to take a short break to do that. Um, so, you know, don't go anywhere, but go, you know, grab, a, grab you something to drink, you know, anything you need to do, stretch. Give our uh, presenter a minute to, to uh, relax and then transition. <laughs> um, so I want to say thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, it was a very interesting topic. And uh, for everyone else who's joining us, thank you. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you to the Roosevelt and Truman Libraries. Um, and then please join in tomorrow at the same time, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time for day two of our Emerging Scholars Symposium, where we will hear from Jordan Pitt about flight neurosis in World War II. But hang out with us for a few more minutes uh, after our brief break, and then we'll come back and talk to Hannah for a little bit.
Okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. My name is Jeff Urban. I'm the Education Director of the Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum in Hyde Park, New York, the nation's very first presidential library, the only one ever used by a sitting president while they were actually president. I'm delighted to be here today as part of this symposium. Um, the folks at Eisenhower came up with this idea. It's a fantastic idea to have these up and coming uh, scholars that we can meet with and talk with. And today we have the pleasure of meeting with Hannah Pulsa. And she is a, correct me if I'm wrong, a PhD student at Kansas State. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. And you're just, what, a year out, right, from, uh, from the actual real life gig? Yeah. So I am entering my third year. So it'll be prelims this fall. Uh oh, uh oh! Now it's now, now it's getting serious. Now it's getting serious. Well, <clears throat> I want to thank you for your your presentation. You know, it was absolutely wonderful. Um, you know, as we all know, World War II was a total war, and um, you know, we're meeting this week to uh, sort of commemorate the the anniversary of the D Day invasion, which of course was critical to the Allied victory uh, in World War uh, II. And you know, much is said, much is written uh, about you know the overall picture, but I love the fact that you know, um, we're able to drop in on these little pockets of unknown stories and unsung heroes and be able to learn about, um, you know, so much. And it really helps to underscore just how total a war this was. I mean, who would think that dogs uh, and children would be such an important uh, part of this? So, Hannah, I'm interested in knowing, like, how did you how did you come to this topic? I mean, you've got all of World War II to talk about. How did you zero in on on, you know, on kitties and canines? Yeah, so um, so originally, actually, I went into my undergrad at Purdue wanting to be a veterinary technician. I realized I was awful at science and decided to major in history. And so I was first actually exposed to my topic in an undergrad seminar on World War II, but I actually spent the my entire undergrad researching the American Civil War. I loved the Civil War. I had focused on the Western theater and the Army of the Cumberland, and I thought that, hey, this is what I want to do when I get into grad school. And then I'm accepted into my master's program, and then December of 2016, two major things happened to me. For one thing, I ended up having to put down my dog who had lymphoma, who had been very much of my heart dog. And also during Christmas, and if my aunt is watching this happened before I had to put Scout down so I don't feel bad. Um, my aunt gave me a book about a German short-haired pointer named Judy, who was actually a mascot in a British Royal Navy ship in World War II. And Judy was actually captured and held in Madon prison camp for a while with her men. She was the only dog to be held as a prisoner of war during World War II. And so for Judy, I really um, started to kind of look at and think, you know, did the United States use dogs in any way? I obviously was very familiar with Fala. I love Fala. But I started to think, what other <laughs> what other ways were dogs used? And so I sat in my advisor's office and mentioned that I wanted to switch my concentration from the American Civil War to animal history. And she had asked me, you know, what, what do you like? And I was like, well, I like dogs. And I like the idea of dogs in the military. So she had given me, I think it was a week to kind of research and see what I could find and then get back to her. And so while I was researching, I stumbled upon dogs for defense. And what really drew me is what I talked about today. It was not just children participating, but it was civilians participating. It was civilians donating their own animals to the war effort because it's frankly something that I think would never happen today in terms of just as a country, how obsessed and in love we are with our dogs. Mm -hmm. And so I think the idea that the modern military working dog started because of civilians willing to say, you know, I love my dog, but right now at this time, I love these soldiers more. Let's see if my dog can help out in the war effort in any way is what really drew me and is what really has kept me going ever since. That's great. Um, just for, you, you mentioned Fallon. Just for those who may not be familiar, this is uh, President Roosevelt and his dog uh, Fallon, who was a very famous dog um, 
during the Roosevelt administration. And Hannah, I want you to know, just so you know, that Fallow was not shirking his responsibility. He was in fact enrolled in the War Dog for Defense uh, program. So um, Fallow was, was doing his part. So it was a passion for dogs and an interest in, in history and war um, that you, you were able to, to pull together um, for this, which is, which is fascinating. And that's always when, it, when things work out the best, when you're passionate about something. So how do you go about starting this, this kind of research? I mean, how do, you, how do you dive in? I mean, you've got all this, this information. Tell me about the, the, the process. How do you break it down? So when I first started, looking into this honestly my best method of research has been newspapers.com in terms of just being able to put in keywords such as dogs for defense or war dogs and i was really surprised at how much this had been covered in the papers and that's what i really found a lot of the fun primary source has been through looking at different newspaper coverages and i think one of my favorite things that i found through a newspaper search has been a woman in California in 1943 writing a letter to the editor because she goes into her local draft board and wants her dog for the weekend. Her dog had already been enlisted in one of in San Carlos's war dog training and reception centers, and she just wants her dog for the weekend, and they say no. And she complains to the editor, well, our boys can come home for the weekend, meaning the human GIs. Why can't my dog come home for the weekend? And in that moment, I think that really kind of sparked an idea of people who donate their dogs, they're seeing not only is donating as a family pet, but they're donating a soldier. And that as soon as their dog goes into that shipping crate, they see their dog as a soldier. Wow. But when I was also, when I began researching this, um, actually, worldcat.org, in terms of looking at books, has a really good tagging system and how books are tagged in the database and so i was able to find a lot of my children's books by using the tag i think just dogs training and war use and going into looking at just the years that dogs for defense was operating from 42 to 45 and so that helped me really kind of narrow on the children's books and other intern and other things like that but for archival sources have been interesting because there's a few that I knew right off the bat. There's the AK Museum of the Dog has some of the, has the War Dog Pilots and Collection, which focuses on dogs in war and specifically Dobermans in war. There had been the Fort Robinson Collection at the Nebraska State Archives, which I'd been lucky enough to visit once during my master's program. That has the entire collection of when Fort Robinson off, operated as a war dog training and reception center. And so not only does it have things like daily training schedules and kennel briefing, it also has material public focused on dogs for defense, such as the promotional material for war dogs in the film. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the pandemic closing everything, the archives that I'm hoping to access next year when the pandemic opens everything up and it's gone, the Dogs for Defense collection and also Fallas collection at the Roosevelt Archives, because I know that all the letters written to Fala, I think would be interesting to see how many times if children writ wrote to Fala about Dogs for Defense, mm -hmm. especially since Fala was a member, but also at the Truman Library, the Office of War um, Information Archives, because the Writers War Board archives that I have in my poll um, Possession, which are found at the Library of Congress, the Writers' War Board did a lot of propaganda and promotional material for Dogs for Defense. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the Office of War Information also did something. I know that they at least produced one 16 millimeter um, film for Dogs for Defense, but I'm just thinking that there has to be more that just hasn't been uncovered yet. That's interesting. You should talk about um, the children writing letters. I know I've seen in our collection, um, dogs have actually written letters to Fowla, um, you know, bragging about their involvement in Barkers for Britain or the, the Dog War Fund and such. So um, I think you're going to find some some really cool stuff there. So, yeah, talk a little bit about how the pandemic impacted this. And this has got to be a really bad time for researchers. I mean, even though there's a lot of stuff online, 
that's not the same as as real live you know getting in there and, and working with the, the primary sources you know uh face to face so tell me a little bit about how that that process has been yeah so the pandemic has been rough i know that a lot of my friends too have had the same challenges as me is that trying to con um communicate with archivists over email although they've been ever so very helpful there's only so much they can do when they're only able to go into the archives certain days a week for a certain amount of time because of pandemic restrictions. Mm -hmm. But I think also um, I was awarded a departmental grant and so for the summer. And so I think it's slightly disappointing because of the pandemic, because of so many things being closed, I'm not able to do as much of the research I think as I wanted to this summer mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really um, that's really put a you know the kibosh on a, on a lot of this stuff, you know, and uh, and you know the these records that we're talking about here are you know stored in in um, archives and need to be accessed. They're not just something you can walk in off the street and, and get to. The archivists need to be able to do that for you. And of course, if they can't get into their their particular archive, um, it's very difficult to to get that information. So, would you describe the um, the uh, the, the the search or the the research uh, process as as more of a is it a is it a shotgun approach is it a rifled approach I mean how do you how do you go about focusing you know um, on this stuff so it's really um, when I first decided to get into this I realized that I want to look at dogs for defense more at, under the light of social and cultural history in terms of how did donating dogs change our ideas of pet keeping? Because before the war and what we certainly have today, it's the belief that you shouldn't do animals any harm and that you shouldn't put them directly in harm's way. It's what animal rights activists in the 19th and 20th century fought for so much is that the protection of animals and the prevention of cruelty. And then World War II comes and it automatically turns everything on its head by saying, yes, we will donate our dogs. We understand that they may die, but we believe that in this country's time of need, that this is greater than any emotional attachment that we have to our animals. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that has been the most interesting for me, but also the most challenging in researching this in that when I first began, it's hard not to put yourself in a 21st century mindset in terms of especially working with animal history. Because of course, no one wants to donate their dog to war. No one could picture donating their animals to war and willingly giving them up to be potentially killed. And I think getting out of that 21st century mindset is a thing that I had to reckon with when I first started with this. And it's also just not getting too emotionally attached to your subject because you wanna be, I've had so many people say, you know, I don't know how you don't get sad every day researching, especially when you see the pictures of the dead dogs or know that or reading memoirs from a soldier whose dog had been killed. And I mean, it's upsetting, but you almost have to slightly detach yourself emotionally from when you are researching. Mm -hmm. But I think the biggest help that is me that's been overcoming challenges has really been my first committee meeting when I mentioned that I wanted to focus on what the, on how people donated their dogs, what convinced them to donate their dogs, and how it challenged ideas of pet keeping rather than a strictly military history of the dogs did this over there and they did this over there. And my committee members were like, you know, write what the dissertation that you want and that's the most interesting to you. And so I think getting in that mindset of, it may be, it may not, It what I want to produce in my dissertation may not be what people expect and they turn, think of dogs in World War during World War II, but it's what's motivating me to continue yeah. the program and that's the most important. Yeah, you hit on a, a bunch of really important topics right there. You know, um, you know, history really has to be seen in its own time. You really, you know, as a researcher, as you know, need to step out of your 21st century mindset and put yourself back in the 1930s and 40s. You know, what was going on in people's minds with this global war? Um, you know, that was going to be responsible ultimately for killing 60 million people, and it, it must have been really tough to get your mind. Um, 
you know, uh, into the mind of the little kid. You know, um, I, I think one of the things that you raised in your talk, which was so important, was that um, from a psychological standpoint, the, the the donating of of the pets, the donating of the dogs to the war effort, really gave the children uh, a sense of of uh, uh, of inclusion, a sense of of, of, of almost power in the sa in the sense that okay, I'm a little nine year old kid. What can I do to you know help fight Nazis? Well, I can send you know Fido um, you know into to to help, and uh, that must have been really tough to 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 get into the you know, to read these stories and things about the little kids. Yeah, because I think that we think of, and this goes back to, I think, of the idea of the pet in the 19th century is that we think of pets and children as linked. You know, when you're a little kid, your best friend is either maybe the family dog or the family cat. Mm -hmm. The family animal is the thing that you grow up learning how to be nice to, how to be a good person to. It's your first thing of friendship, even if they can't talk back to you, but you can still play with them. Mm -hmm. You can still dress them up as I do my cat in funny costumes and things. Mm -hmm. It's the first friend that you make before you go to kindergarten or preschool. And so donating that, it's you're donating a friend, you're donating for many children, what's your closest confidant? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, you mentioned you have a cat, huh? I do. <laughs> okay. So do you think there were ever any, um, you know, I, I, you know, cats are just so sly and they're so cool and they're so, you know, um, I, I could just see cats signing up the family dog to go off to war just to make a little extra room around the, uh, around the house. Um, so you, you mentioned there was some kind of like a little bit of a movement to, to have the same sort of um, uh, program for cats so they could feel you know, that they were contributing as well, but that never really, really took off, huh? No, they actually tried to um, start a civilian cat corps, and it was actually the wife of a admiral who had two Siamese cats enlisted in the war dog fund. And so it was the belief that cats just needed the same rank and membership as their dogs, but it never really took off. But instead, boys and girls and adults, the cat fanciers of America, donated money to the War Dog Fund, and they still got their cats a rank, whether it be in the Navy or the Army or the feet or either the Waves or the Wakes. And so they were able to get their cats the ranks that they wanted to show that their cat, too, was participating in the war effort. It just wasn't able to go to the front lines. Oh, that's great. Well, the cats may have been happy about that. You know, they get to get the rank and the, and the privileges without actually having to get their, their little paws um, uh, dirty. So these dogs, you mentioned, you know, they... they these are dogs, and I mean, there's old. I'm reminded of the old expression: "You can't teach an old dog new tricks." But you're sending these dogs into the military. They're being trained for these incredible tasks of being a sentry, being a messenger, being a guard dog. Um, they do some. They do have some attack training because you know they gotta have to have that in their little arsenal. Um, and then the war's over, and the dog goes goes home. And, Tell me a little bit more about about that. Like, how do you decommission a, a you know a, a dog? Was there was there such a thing as like a post traumatic effect for the dog? I mean, you know, if, if the dog's in this in this war and then and now it's back in the backyard, that must have been a tough transition. How do you how do you transition the dog back for that? Yeah. So for the dogs, there was actually a demobilization process, and so it took about I believe between eight to sixteen weeks, and so dogs were actually reacclimated to regular civilian concepts. You might take the dog walking around a busy traffic area. So it got used to the sirens of a fire truck or a police car or just the regular traffic noise again. You taught dogs how to accept pets and attention from anyone rather than being a one or two dog thing. Dogs went through the process of un really learning not how to attack on command and not be vicious. And so that they could go back to being family pets again. Wow. However, whenever dogs were, went home, they did go with small um, notes from the reception centers and Dogs for Defense saying that your dog had served in war. They've been every, there's been every undertaking to make sure that their dog, your dog is not vicious upon arriving or aggressive, but please remain with caution. And so for some of the dogs that did act out, that did either um, 
bite either if the dog is taunted or just out of reflex, it was often excused. And the fact that the dog is a veteran, it may be experiencing PTSD. Mm-hmm. Of course, it wouldn't have been PTSD, especially not for animals back then. Right. But it was very much of give the dog space and allow it to kind of acclimate on its own, just like some of the material for returning GIs was that give the GI space and let them open up to you as they are for the dog. It was give the dog space and let them come to you. Did the dog serve for a particular period of time or once the dog was trained, was he in for the duration or did he have like a, like a one year rotation or something like that? He usually would have been in for the duration, but um, for most of the dogs that were shipped into the European theaters, their duration would have ended in 44 And so they would have been demobilized then once you get into the more winter warfare and fighting in the urban cities because it was the belief that dogs wouldn't, weren't needed as much in Europe by then as they were in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. And so for the Pacific theater, the dogs served the entire time. I see, I see. And I assume that when the dogs were serving, they were serving in human years, not in dog years? (laughs) <laughs> yes. <laughs> that could come in very, you know, it could be very confusing when it comes time to calculate pensions um, and things like that. So what was the biggest surprise? I mean, you, so you, you, you've got this idea, you, you know, you, you're, you're, you're looking in these newspapers, you're looking in these, um, these archives, some you can't get into because of the, the pandemic and such. You're looking at the social and cultural background of, of you know, how the, 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 the mindset of, of about children and pets and you know what what surprised you like what, what, what did you you know was there a eureka moment of wow I never thought about that I think honestly the biggest thing that surprised me the most was how much it was pushed toward children there were a few things that I didn't talk about in this presentation but there were a few radio programs written by the writers war board that specifically dealt with fictional children donating their animals there were instances of children going on radio explaining how they donated their dogs to the war effort. And so I think what really surprised me was how much it was pushed toward children, but also how much it was pushed toward young boys. Mm-hmm. And the fact that all of the propaganda that I've mentioned today and all the sources dealt with fictional boys donating their dogs. It was boys that donate their dogs that we have the most letters and records of. Mm-hmm. And so well, I think... I'm sorry, go ahead. That was the thing that I think surprised me the most is how gendered it is because the dog can be loved by any member of the family, but so much of it is pushed toward the belief that it's a a way for boys to really participate in the war effort is donating your dog. The other thing that really surprised me was just the love that the owners had for these dogs. Because I think we think that you send your dog to the war, you don't love it. You clearly don't. But these owners wrote thousands of letters to the quartermaster department. So much so that the quartermaster department basically says, assume that your dog is fine. Please stop writing. We will contact you and if your dog is killed in the war or if it needs to be returned. But other than that, please assume that it is okay. They sent candy and birthday cards and Christmas cards to their dogs and their handlers. And they got excited if they saw the dog at a demonstration. So these owners clearly loved their animals. That's amazing. You know, I, I get that sense, you know, from your, uh, when I read your abstract and you mentioned it in your talk, you said, if you need a real good dog, I'll loan you mine until the war is over. I mean, that just, that's just so poignant, you know, um, the, but you could, you can tell that child is, it's got such faith and confidence and love and, and, um, you know, respect for his, for his animal and for his country, because he's, he is, he's giving up this incredible, um, you know, valuable asset, uh, to his own, um, you know, to his own life and his own world. And especially, um, you know, during that time, I know President Roosevelt felt very attached to Fala because um, Fala gave him that release uh, of, you know, all Fala wanted was to have his belly rubbed and a little biscuit, you know, um, mm-hmm. and, you know, the unconditional love that, that the, the people gave to the animal, the animal also gave back to the people. So to have that, 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 animal that you have that's giving you this unconditional love and then say, you know what, I need you to do this job. Um, It's just an incredible, um, you know, incredible thing. Uh, So how did you separate your, um, 
your love for the animals with, you know, it's, it's gotta be tough. Like you, like you say, you're going in every day, you're reading these stories about these, you know, these, the separate, this continual separation over and over and over again. Um, how do you, how do you insulate yourself against that? How do you, how do you prepare for that? I think for one thing helps knowing that as morbid as these, the sounds, these dogs are all dead now. I mean, I know it sounds awful to think, but I'm not working with live subjects. It's mm -hmm. everyone who's I'm writing about has passed. And so I think that helps as morbid as it is to kind of foster that disconnect. But I think also just thinking that, you know, it's war and that these children, for as painful as it may have been, they understood that they had to do anything and that World War II was an all-in effort. They may have not wanted to donate their dog, but they saw their mother at the store trying to fight the horse with her ration coupons to see if she could get enough sugar or maybe their dad has been shipped off to go basic training or their brother and sister have taken factory jobs and have to carpool to work now. They see other people doing things to help win the war effort. And these children are like, well, I may not want to donate my dog, but it's an all in war and I have to do what I have to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, that, that's such a great point. It really was an all in war. You know, the men and women on the front lines were certainly doing their part, but they depended upon us um, back on the home front, uh, whether it was in the factories, whether it was, you know, rationing the rubber and the food and the, um, you know, flour and the sugar and the paper and all those sorts of things. And, um, you know, and the, and the things like victory gardens, uh, the scrap drives, the, the, you know, donating your dogs for defense really, um, make people feel like they were really in the war effort uh, right there with those soldiers on the, on the front lines. And I know that probably made the soldiers on the front lines uh, feel a lot better about that now. So what is next for Hannah Pulsa? You, you, you're, you're fin finishing up next year. Um, and um, what, what is next? Is this, does this research become a book? Yeah. So I'll still have a few more years before I'm officially done with the doctorate, but <laughs> I would like it to become a book. I've, um, I think that in terms of looking at the World War II literature, this has been something that's really been overlooked, in my opinion, in terms of how we understand the home front and how we understand civilian volunteerism in World War II. And I think it, I think one thing that going back to your comment of what surprised you, I think I'm surprised at how this really hasn't been covered. And it honestly, it made me a bit sad when I started looking at it because it was people who willingly gave their animals to war, but no one's really looked at their sacrifice as a means of participating in World War II. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm hoping that it would become a book to be able to give them the light that I think that they've deserved for so long. Well, that's great. You know, Cliff Lobby, who is our public affairs specialist at the Roosevelt Presidential Library, has a uh, annual book uh festival and we have 10 or 12 authors that come and they've all written books about something about the Roosevelt's <clears throat> or the Roosevelt era and I would be delighted <clears throat> to introduce you at one of those uh, a couple of years down the line when you when you have your book um, you know have you here to Hyde Park show you around um, you know let you let you see the, uh, the museum if you haven't done that and then um, share with a broader audience um, the wonderful research that you've done on this incredible topic it really is um, you know, one of those little corners of the war, um, so, and there are so, so many of them um, that, that meant so much to so many people. But, you know, we, we hear about sort of the, the highlights or the, you know, the big attention getting things. And, um, you know, with yesterday being uh, Memorial Day, you know, what a wonderful opportunity to, to take some mo moments and some time to think about those that, that you know, gave so much, uh, you know, to the war. And, and yes, in the case of yesterday, it was, you know, men and women giving their lives with your talk. It's, it's people giving their their animals, um, and um, you know I look forward to, um, to to hearing all about your your career as you progress. Um, I am going to go um, you know give my dog a snuggle um, because you you've helped me to reinvigorate uh, my uh, my respect for for him. 
And um, it's been my pleasure to uh, spend this time with you. Thank you so much for, for sharing the, 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 the scholar behind the work uh, with us today. And for those of you that are watching, um, keep in mind that we've got a whole week's worth of program uh, coming to you um, through the Eisenhower uh, Library with uh, a little bit of help from the uh, Roosevelt Library and from the Truman Library. So we look forward to uh, seeing you all for the rest of the week. Um, Hannah, have a great week. And um, I, I'm, I'm serious. I look forward to introducing you at the Roosevelt Library a couple years down the line. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. This has been this has been fun. I'm going to go give my cat a hug, but I'm really thankful <laughs> that this has been put on and that we're able to showcase our work as emerging scholars. We have the Eisenhower Library to thank for that because this was this was their undertaking. So we thank our friends there as well. Okay, folks, so we'll see you again tomorrow.